And so we're going to start in John chapter 1, verse 1. It's the fourth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, then John. But I want to start talking about who this guy is. He's John, the son of Zebedee. So he's not John the Baptist. You may have heard that guy. John, the son of Zebedee. He had a brother named Andrew, and he was a fisherman. He and his brother were fishermen, and Jesus came to him and said, follow me. I want you, I want you to follow me. And so he left his career and his uh, old lifestyle and started following Jesus. And he had a nickname. He and his brother were known as the Sons of Thunder, which is a nickname that in that time was meant to communicate that he had an anger problem, <laughs> that he would kind of blow up. Do you ever have somebody in your life like that, where, you, where you're like, they're like a ticking time bomb? Well, John was sort of known as a ticking time bomb. Like, this guy has a lot of feelings, <laughs> and he's going to let you know about them. But what's crazy is over the course of his life, he has this encounter, this friendship with Jesus. And Jesus is born, lives for uh, three decades, and then dies and rises from the grave. And, and John then begins to spend the rest of his life telling people about Jesus. And all of John's letters are about love and faith and life. They're about mercy and forgiveness. And so this guy who was known for his anger problems and for his pride becomes known for his love. He had a total life-altering, life-changing experience with Jesus. Put yourself in his shoes for a second. He had some crazy life experiences. In the Gospel of Mark, we read that he was one of a select few people to see Jesus raise a child from the dead. He was there and he watched Jesus, according to John 19, he's, he watched Jesus take his final breath. In fact, Jesus looked to this man, John, and said, John, will you take, in so many words, he said, will you take care of my mother after I'm gone? It's probably not just to say that he was Jesus' best friend on earth. And then he saw Jesus raised from the dead. And it completely changed him forever. I was uh, in Seattle several years back, and when I go to a new place, I love to take public transit. Do you guys enjoy exploring a city like that? So I was up in Seattle, and I was staying in a hotel near downtown, and, uh, and I decided that I don't want to rent a car. I just I wanted to take the bus everywhere. This was before like Uber and Lyft were like a big deal, and so like the bus was my strategy. And, and I was going everywhere, just meeting people, making friends. And I was on a bus one time, and I saw a guy who had a backpack, and he was, like, looks like a hitchhiker. And so I just, like, got to know him. And I asked him, hey, like, what are you up to? Where are you headed? What's your story? And he told me that he had been in the military, and that a friend of his who was in the military had lost his life in active duty. And so when he got back to the States, he was looking for direction. He was looking for meaning. And he wanted his own life to have meaning, but he also wanted his friend's life to have meaning. He wanted his friend not to be forgotten, for there to be some purpose, some honor in it. And so sitting there on the bus with the stranger, he explains to me, so I am backpacking up the entire West Coast in his honor. And everywhere I go, I'm, just, I'm making this trip. This is sort of a dream adventure for him. And so for my fallen friend's honor, I'm going to make this journey. He left everything behind. He, did, he didn't go back to friendships or relationships or worry about his career or his next steps. He said, I'm going to give everything to honor my fallen friend. And that's the kind of devotion, that's the kind of commitment that the author John has to his friend Jesus. He says, man, this, this guy, his life had meaning, it had worth. It was, it was worth talking about. It was worth remembering. It was worth lifting up. It was worth rearranging my life for. But the difference is, unfortunately, this gentleman that I was talking to, 
was coming from a place of deep woundedness, of deep hurt, of deep loss. Hoping, dreaming, praying, perhaps, that his friend's life would have meaning and purpose. Hoping that maybe for himself he could find what was next for him. And he shared with me that he didn't know if he would ever stop wandering. He didn't know if he'd ever be able to go home. If he'd ever have a place to rest his head. He was still on the journey, still seeking. What are we here for? Do I have a place? Is this going anywhere? But see, John found something else in Jesus. John found a sense of purpose and direction and meaning and fulfillment, a life that no one could take it away. Nothing could empty him of it. And so he starts writing scriptures. He writes the story of his experiences with Jesus that we read in the book of John. And we read in chapter 20, he says, I wrote all of this so that you could just believe all these things about him are true. I wrote all of these just so you could know. He says, a million pages, a million books couldn't have filled the whole earth with how many great things he did, but I just, I wanted to tell you enough for you to get to know this guy, Jesus. And it was, uh, he was persecuted for it, and they wanted to put him in jail, and they tried to boil this guy John alive. Like, they put him in a, a vat of boiling oil, and they tried to, to boil him alive, and they said, stop talking about Jesus, stop telling everybody about him. You're causing social unrest, you're causing drama, we don't want this. And he survived it, and still after that, wrote four more of the books of the New Testament that we have and just kept talking about Jesus. History knows him as John the Evangelist because he just wouldn't stop talking about his experiences with Jesus. He gave his life meaning and direction. It reorganized, reoriented everything. And it's with that in mind that we read the first verses of John chapter 1, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now, the original readers would have immediately perked up when they read this. Because this scripture, the beginning of John, sounds very, very much like another part of scripture. You may guess which part. The beginning. It says, in the beginning. If you have a Bible, you want to flip over to Genesis chapter 1. It's the very like first page of your Bible. If you got one, if you're looking through the table of contents, it's the very beginning, page 1. Genesis 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. See, it, back in, in the beginning of the scriptures in Genesis, it describes the time when there was nothing except God. And God created everything that is, and God spoke even light into existence. And John starts his gospel and says, in the beginning, there was something there with God. There was God, God there. And there's something you've got to know about this creation story, this beginning of the universe. He says, the word was with God, and the Word was God. John is referring to something or someone that was active in the creation of the entire universe. Something or someone who has always been, since before the planets, before the stars, before anything else, before the waves and the tides, before the plants and the animals and humanity, 
There was something, someone there before all of this. In John, this phrase, the word, we find out quickly, refers to Jesus. And he's saying, this, this friend of mine that I knew in the flesh, this person that I talked to, day after day spending time with him, there was, there was something different about him. He wasn't like the rest of the people. He was, he was before all things. He was before anything was made. Also, the readers would have known that this word, the word, is a Greek word, uh, logos, and it was a very important word in Greek and Jewish philosophy in the centuries leading up to the birth of Christ. And according to Greek philosophers, the word means these things. The source of order in the universe that by which all things come into being and all things come to pass. The word is the plan or model of the universe, the source of human reason and intelligence. It's something not understood by humankind. It's universal. It's eternal. The, this word logos was the Greek way, the ancient philosopher's way of trying to describe God. They said there's something out there. Maybe you've heard like, there's some sort of higher power. There's some sort of bigger reason. There's some sort of fate out there. And, and the philosophers were always searching for it. What is this thing that holds the universe together? What's the thing that explains all of all that is around us? And, and they had this word for it, the logos, the word. And so John says, in the beginning, There was this reason for everything. There was this reason for creation. There was this reason it all works together and fits together. There was this purpose and guiding principle for how the universe works. And that reason was Jesus. And so, if you would, if you would bring up the scriptures, to, I want you to read the beginning of John's gospel this way. In the beginning was Jesus, the reason for everything. And Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Jesus was in the beginning with God. John says, I spent my entire life with him, and I'm telling you, this was no ordinary human being. This wasn't a good teacher with a few life lessons. This was much more than this. This was the divine come to earth. The reason for everything walked among us. So John is saying Jesus is the cause of all things. He is above all things. He is the guiding light for all that exists. Jesus is, according to John's gospel, the meaning of life itself. Have you ever found yourself searching for meaning? Where is this all going? What am I here for? Do I matter? Do my choices matter? Do my relationships matter? And John wrote to say, oh, there is such, such, such meaning to life. There is such purpose. There's something bigger out there. There's something better out there. There is hope. There's a reason for all this. It's all moving towards something. And it's found not in a to-do list. It's found not far away, but it's found in a relationship with God through Jesus. All of life, all of the purpose of this church our hope for serving the community, who we want to be as people, how we want to model our lives, all of it is centered in, it's wrapped up in who Jesus is. 
And, and, and John here uses some really specific language to describe what the church has for two millennia called, referred to as the Trinity. The fact that there's a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit, and they're distinct, but there's one God. They're so united in their essence, in their purpose, in their being, that you can say there's one God, and yet there's these distinct relationships where you have a Father, and a Son, and a Holy Spirit, and together they make this one God. It's like how, it's like how you have a, a body and a soul, but there's one of you, or you have an, a heart and a head, but, but there's one body. And you couldn't separate. If you were to take your head off of your body, it's like you would say, well, like, you know, where's Katie? It's like, well, I don't know. Her head's over here, and her, but her body's over here. It doesn't make sense, right? There's what? No, she's either here or she's not. She's a unified being, and God is this one unified being, but he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so, and, and so John is trying to explain to us that, that in his love for us, God came to us in the, in the form of Jesus. And because of that, life has meaning. Verse 3, we see that Jesus designed everything for a purpose. It says, verse 3, through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. There is Nothing in the world, according to the scriptures, there is nothing in the world that has come into being without God causing it. He is the first cause, and that means he's the designer. He's the creator. You ever found yourself struggling in your relationships? God invented relationships. He himself is relational within himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're friends with each other. They love each other. They serve each other. They submit to one another. God is the, the model. Jesus is the model for perfect relationships. We find it in him. He's the source. He invented them. You ever find yourself struggling physically? God's the one who made human life. We go back to Genesis, and it says he, out of nothing, made everything, and then made humanity out of the dirt and breathed life into it, breathed his spirit into us. You ever had emotional struggles? You wonder, how, man, how am I supposed to feel about things? How am I supposed to think about things, process the world? God invented feelings. God has the capacity to feel, and he made us with the capacity to feel. You ever struggled with your creativity? Maybe you're an artist, and you thought, well, what does God have to do with that? God literally, it says he created everything. <laughs> you ever, so I, I dare you right now, think of a color that doesn't exist. Can you do it? I'm going to give you a moment. It's not easy. You know why? Because God already invented all the colors. You want know, to think about something being crazy? Before anything existed, God thought of all the colors. And he spoke light into being, and he spoke light and color into the world. You want to, you think, man, oh, God, like the church and the world, they hate creatives. There's no room for my art. No, 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 God, God invented, he's the artist. This whole universe is his painting. Jesus designed everything for a purpose. And if we want to know what the purpose of a thing is, we have to ask the inventor. And that goes for even ourselves as human beings. That God created humanity. He made you and I with value and dignity in his image with a purpose. And that purpose being to be in a thriving relationship with him and with the people around us. That purpose being to honor God in the way that we enjoy his creation. To glorify God by the way that we behave like God. Would behave. 
we don't get to decide our purpose. You ever tried to build like IKEA furniture? I'm not a very good artist or craftsman. Some of you are handy. Mine always end up wobbly and with extra parts. <laughs> and I swear I follow the instructions. I swear I follow the instructions. And, and all the pieces fit together. But every time, you know what I have to do? I gotta go to watch. We live in the world of YouTube, thank God. Because <laughs> now I read through the instructions, I can't figure it out, and I'm like, you know what? I need an expert to show me. I'm gonna go on YouTube and I'm gonna find the person where you watch their hands as they put it all together and they have like the soothing voice while they're like, you're gonna get through this. And I need to watch those guiding videos. Jesus is the one who designed it all, all of life, how it all fits together. He's the one who made everything. And when we're putting together our lives as best we can, and we're like, yeah, that's close. I don't want to get these extra parts, but it's close. I don't get how this piece fits in, but I'm kind of, I'm making the most of it, and that's what we do. And we, we charge through, and we, we try to hang tight, and we try to hold on to loved ones. We try to do our best one day at a time. And God's saying, hey, I love you. Every, I appreciate the effort. I know how this works. And I made it to work. Jesus designed everything for a purpose. And he is our guide to life. It says in verse 4, in him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. See, Jesus is not just the source of, um, not just the source of everything, not just the designer of everything, but actually, he, he is a light in the darkness. He's a, flash fl a flashlight when we can't see. When we're, when we're lost, when we're confused, when we're groping in the dark, looking for the answers. We read it in the beginning. There was nothing, and God spoke light into being. When it seems hopeless, he shows us a way. I, um, sometimes at the church, we get people reaching out, asking for help, assistance, people off the streets, or people looking to try to get into rehab or housing or different things. And, and we want to be available uh, to be able to help in those times of needs. And, and we don't necessarily aren't able to solve everything ourselves, but so we connect them to community resources. And, but we try to be along with people for the journey. Well, this week, I had somebody reach out who was saying, hey, can, our, can, can Thrive, can this church help somebody who's recently been forced to kind of start living out of her car and get her on her feet. And so we did some legwork and explored some different options and we found a bed in a women's place that not even a, like a shelter, but more transitional housing that would have been just like a really good setup. And we drove down, we met there at the place and tried to get her set up. And... But I'll never forget talking with this valuable, vulnerable woman She just kept saying, I'm worthless. Nobody cares about me. I've already tried all the places. There's nobody that there's no place that'll take me. It's too hard. It's too lost. The hope is lost. Like we can't fix this. And so even as we were at this first place and they do this little interview intake process, and just the whole time she's telling the lady reasons why it won't work. And I'm going, come on, come on, help, like, tell her you're going to make it work. Like, she's going to give you a bed, and that's me, and I'm a fixer, and I think I'm the designer of the universe, and I can't solve life's problems. And... But, but there was no more hope left. There was no feeling like there was any worth left in her life, and so what's the point? And in the darkest moments, in the darkest hours, when you think 
And this relationship is beyond hope. When you think, my life, I already messed it up too bad. And you think, man, like, I needed to do this 10 years ago. I remember I was sitting in a college class, and it was an economics professor, and he looked out, and he said, some of you think you're going to make something of your life. And he said, but you're 21, and anybody who is going to be a billionaire already would have done it by now, and you're not that special. <laughs> and I just, and that's probably, I mean, I didn't become a billionaire. It's not like he was wrong, but it was just like, come on, man. <laughs> like, try to be, like, believe in us a little bit, you know? <laughs> But that's kind of, we, we carry that weight on our shoulders. Like, man, I'm too, I'm over the hill. Like, I've lost my chance. I've already wasted it. I've already messed it up. I'm already in a relationship that I, that I was a mistake. I'm, I already didn't go to the school. I didn't get the degree I should have gotten. Or, I mean, I already made bad choices. There's no hope for me. Or worse, sometimes we, I don't know if it's worse, it's equally bad. We think that about others. We think they're gone, they're too late, they could never become anything, they could never fix their lives, they could never be like me. And John says, you know what? Even if you're like me, John raises his hand, he says, even if you're like me with an anger and a pride problem, there's a light darkness. And in verse 5, he says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You may be looking at the world around you. You may be looking at the politics of our world. You may be looking at the wars and the, the genocides and the inequalities and the, and the slave trades happening around the world. You may be looking in your neighborhood and seeing the struggles of division and, and inequality, and you may be thinking, man, this world is lost. It's all just getting worse, and we're all just going to hell, and it's too late. That's how they felt back then. Because we look at the world, and there's bad stuff in the world, because we've rejected God's design, and we've done things our own way. And the world's at times fallen apart, but, you, but John says, I, I, I want you to know that the darkness has not overcome the light. When there's light on in a room, you can't shine darkness out it and put it out. <laughs> no, light makes darkness flee. And John says, man, where Jesus goes, the light goes. The path forward comes. Life flourishes. And the seeds come out of the ground and the, and the trees start to rise up and the fruit is produced. Life takes root. When the light shines down. You have not lost your chance. It is not too late. And the world is not worth giving up on. Because Creator God us to invite us back home. And to say, I have a place of safety, I have a place of flourishing, I have a place of love. Friends, today, <clears throat> do you believe that life has meaning? Do you believe that there's a purpose to this? That there's something bigger, something greater? And John found it in Jesus. They couldn't tie him up. But put him in the vat and boiled him, and they couldn't get him to stop. Consumed all of who he was <clears throat> as he had found meaning of life. Let's pray. God, we ask that God, we ask that you would speak to us, that you would guide us. 
God, we ask that you would show us how life works best and that you would give us hope. Lord, I want to confess personally that most days I'm just looking at the next step. I don't see where it's all going. I don't see how it all works together. But God, we want to trust you that you have a plan, that you have a path forward, that you made things to work a certain way. Jesus, that you're God. We love you, Lord. And God's people said, I'd rather be than hearing your love, hearing the love of God. And I think just this morning as we reflect on this, I want these words just to wash over you as you think through. What does it mean to truly be in the love of God? And that love produces the light inside of us. And so as we continue our time of worship, I'd love you just to sit in this, this moment.
something that we do to just remember Jesus and to reconnect with him. So as the music plays, as we um, take some time, just go ahead and sit, take some time in your own heart, pray, and you can grab a piece of bread, dip it in the wine, and take it. If you're not comfortable with that, I totally get it. You're welcome here, wherever you're at with Jesus. Um, but feel free. This might be your first Sunday where you say, hey, I feel like I want to do this. This is a step I want to take in my faith journey. And so um, go ahead and just take a minute with Jesus.
place I'd rather be. It's no place I'd rather be. It's no place I'd rather be. Here in your love, here in your love. It's no place I'd rather be. It's no place I'd rather be. It's no place I'd rather be. Here in your love. Yeah. 
sin had left the crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left. Sin had left the crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Amen. Thank you so much. Okay, go ahead and take a seat just real quick. A um, couple last things. Uh, at this time, we normally take an offering. Um, if you consider Thrive a part of your church family, then this is just an opportunity for you to give back, um, but it is not an obligation. And if you are new here, we're not here to take your money. We're not here um, to do that. But it's just something that we as a family do because we have seen the generosity of God in our lives and we want to give back to that. And so this is a way that we um, are able to help our community more is by having those resources to do so. So that's an opportunity for you. Uh, you can go to thrivelachurch.com slash give. That's a little hard to see. Or um, you can give at the back table. There's a little box there. Um, just wanted to welcome you to the First Steps Lunch. It's literally right after church, so go ahead and just go through those doors. We would love to have um, some pizza with you, so I hope you can make it. Um, and we're just really grateful that you're here. We hope you have a great week. We love you, and go in peace. Oh, big announcement. The 16th, we're going to have an all-church barbecue at Echo Park Lake. I'm so sorry. That's a big deal. Um, so that'll be super fun. Is it right after church or a little yeah, later? Noon. So. Noon. Yes. Echo Park Lake, right? Oh, yes. Is that right? Okay, cool. On the 16th. So be there, be square. Be there. Nobody wants to be square. All right. We'll see you later. Thanks. <laughs> Like help them get dressed. Actually, the morning before we.